So well, as he's mentioned, I'll be talking about colorectal cancer screening and prevention. But before I do so, it's important for you to understand what the colon is, what the colon and the rectum is, and what its function is all about. So essentially, when you eat food, the food goes down your esophagus into the stomach where it gets churned into a paste or a chyme, and that then gets transported into your small bowel where special nutrients get absorbed and give you all your energy and your strength. And then this liquid paste gets transferred into your colon. The colon is composed of a number of parts. The beginning is called the cecum which joins the right colon or the ascending colon into the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid, which is that loop right here, and then into the rectum. So the food, uh, that liquid uh, paste that goes into the colon um, sort of gets transformed into a more solid uh, form by getting all of the uh, waters absorbed through the bowel, and through the large bowel into your vascular system. And that creates that thicker paste, what we call stool, which gets transported all the way down to your rectum by the muscular activity of the bowel, which we call peristalsis. And that stool gets basically stored in your rectum until you're ready to defecate. So the colon essentially uh, is composed of a number of uh, different layers. Uh, the important layer that uh, you want to know about today is the inner lining called the mucosa. That inner lining is where most of the colorectal cancers occur. Um, the other layers include the submucosa, which you see here, is the second layer underneath the mucosa, and then the muscular layer, which is where the muscular activity allows the food to get propelled further into your digestive system. So the initial place where the colorectal cancers arise are in this layer right here. Most cancers initially arise as polyps in that inner lining. So what happens is that inner lining gets affected by certain mutations due to genetic alterations, due to environmental factors, and sometimes some inherited genetic components. The proliferation of cells creates the polyp that you see here. And if there's further proliferation due to m more mutations, those cells start invading through the bowel wall into the muscular, muscular layer and through the muscular layer into the lymph nodes and then spreads through your blood system to different organs like the liver and the lungs. We, a lot of people think that uh, most colorectal cancers are all inherited. In fact, only about 10 to 30 percent of the cancers are inherited, and another about 6 percent uh, form uh, these kind of inherited syndromes that we talk about, like HNPCC and FAP. But most cancers just occur due to sporadic mutations, about 65 to 85 percent of them. So again, most of the cancers will arise in adenomas or polyps, and uh, about 25 percent of adults will have these polyps uh, from the age of 50 on. The larger the polyps are, the more there's a chance that, it's, uh, it, that it harbors a cancer. And the progression to cancer is usually very slow. It takes about five to 10 years. So you would think that if you eliminate the polyp, then you eliminate the risk of the cancer, and that is true. And that's exactly what this big, huge study, the National Polyp Study, has proven. It was a study that included over 2,000 patients that I'll mention again throughout the talk. And essentially, it showed that once you've completed a full polypectomy during colonoscopy and removed all the polyps seen, you will not see any advanced cancers in the next five years. The other important thing to understand is that the average five-year survival is about 60% overall, and that will fall to even below 50% if the cancer is very advanced, which is often um, the case when we first see patients that have symptoms with, with, uh, with cancers. If the cancer, however, remains localized at the stage where the patient is still asymptomatic, the survival rate rises to 90%. So again, no one should die from colorectal cancer. Uh, early detection of the asymptomatic disease, which is the stage such as the polyp, is the most effective way of increasing the survival from colorectal cancer. So it's a disease that no one should die from. It's preventable, it's beatable, and it's treatable. And it can be prevented through screening through two functions. You can either identify the polyps and remove them at the time of the colonoscopy, and that will prevent colorectal cancer, or you will identify a cancer at an earlier stage, at which time it's better treated and beatable, and therefore you'll be able to prevent mortality from colorectal cancer. So it's that simple, we know how to beat it. <coughs> this is what we want to do. We want to search for the polyps and destroy them. 
However, there are a lot of myths around colorectal cancer that impede people from going on to getting screened so we could find those polyps and destroy them. Some people think nothing you can do about it, about getting it, but uh, in fact, as I've shown you, yes, you can. Okay, this can be prevented by a simple screening method, which will help you get rid of the polyp, which will help you get rid of the cancer, or at least find the cancer at an earlier stage where you can still treat it. It's usually fatal. That's false. I just showed you evidence that if you treat it early or you find the polyps early, you'll prevent the cancer altogether. If you find the cancer at an earlier stage, you'll be able to cure it. It's a disease of older men. I'll show you in further slides that's not true. This can affect men or, men or women of any race. Screening is only necessary for individuals with symptoms, but once you have symptoms, you're not talking about screening anymore. You're talking about diagnosis. And the point where you have symptoms, the cancer is usually advanced. So you want to get <coughs> screening so you can prevent the formation of the cancer altogether. <coughs> so if you look at the leading causes of cancer deaths in Canada in 2005, colorectal cancer was the second leading cause after lung in men and the third leading cause after lung in breast in females. It was estimated in 2005 that there would be at least 19,600 cases diagnosed, and about half of them would die. And unfortunately, in Quebec, the, Quebec has the third highest rate of mortality from colorectal cancer compared to all other provinces, which is a fairly sad statement. In terms of lifetime probabilities, the risk of developing a cancer is about 1 in 15 in males and females, and the risk of dying from it is about 1 in 30. These graphs essentially show you that since we've been able to start screening for certain cancers, like prostate cancer in men and uh, breast cancer in females with mammograms, um, the incidence of cancers has increased because it has allowed us to find more of these cancers. With colorectal cancer and screening methods for colorectal cancer, the incidence has not risen the same way as prostate cancer or breast cancer, and the reason for that is that we have a premalignant lesion for colorectal cancer, the polyp. So if you remove the polyp, we're actually going to prevent the cancer, so you won't be finding the cancer. So in fact, it's completely preventable. Same thing happens for the mortality rate. Because you're identifying cancer sooner, the incidence of mortality tends to decrease, and same thing happens with colorectal cancer. So finally, really what we're talking about is screening, and the purpose of screening is twofold. One is prevention by removing the polyps, which will actually decrease the incidence of the cancer itself, the colorectal cancer, and secondarily, early detection, which will allow you to treat the cancer at an earlier stage where you can still cure it and therefore decrease mortality. Unfortunately, we're not so good at screening in this province or in many other provinces uh, in Canada. As you can see here, this is actually an American survey, but it reflects a lot what we see here in Montreal and in Quebec. Um, tests such as pap smears and mammograms done for screening of cervical cancer or breast cancer, many people tend to go ahead and pursue these tests, about up to 80% rate of success at screening for these um, cancers. But when it comes to colorectal cancer, we see less than a 30% success rate of screening, which is fairly sad and probably amongst this 30%, a lot of them actually probably had these tests done for symptoms rather than screening. So as you can see, we're not very good at screening in this province. The obstacles to screening, well, patient ignorance, which is why many of you are here, which is why we often give these talks and try to educate people. Patient fear, people are afraid of the pain of the procedure, they're afraid of undergoing the bowel preparation, which is said to be a nightmare. Um, they fear the results of the tests, which is something normal. Um, and often people are just simply embarrassed to have this test done because of this long tube that we're basically inserting up your bottoms and <laughs> making you uncomfortable. So a lot of the factors are patient-related, but the most significant factor is physician-related. And a lot of family doctors basically don't refer, and that's a big problem. That's why it's very important to educate you, the public, so that you know to go and ask for your colonoscopy when it's time. And we'll let you know throughout the talk when is it necessary for you to have these tests done. So the Stop Colorectal Cancer Foundation basically went on to survey Americans, and they found that 99% of Americans did not, were not able to name uh, colorectal cancer when they were asked to name a disease that can, can, that can be fatal and kill them. 80% of them mentioned cancer, but only 1% of them were able to mention colorectal cancer as a cause. 
25% of the population could not name one way to prevent colorectal cancer. 4% of the population named screening tests as a way to protect themselves against colorectal cancer. That's a minute amount. 40% of the Americans could not name one warning sign of colorectal cancer. 90% of them believed that it was the physician's responsibility to recommend screening, which makes sense. 63% of the Americans over 50 years old were not getting screened for colorectal cancer. And that's probably a fairly fair estimate of uh, what's happening here in our province as well. 50% of the Americans over 50 said their doctors did not discuss colorectal cancer screening with them. 90% of them said that if their doctor had recommended screening, they would have gotten screened. And once people get screened, we know that they have a three threefold chance of getting screened again in the future. A uh, more recent survey that was done here in Quebec by one of my colleagues, Dr. Charlebo, who practices at the Montreal General when he was a resident, actually um, surveyed about 8,000 family physicians. Only about 10% of them responded. And of those 10%, only about 25% said they make an attempt at screening their patients. <coughs> Fairly sad statement. So when we talk about advanced colorectal cancer and symptoms of colorectal cancer, we're already talking of, about a diagnosis, not about screening. Okay, so people with symptoms, you're not talking about screening, you're talking about actually diagnosing a problem. And the kind of symptoms that you can expect with an advanced colorectal cancer include blood in the stool, persistent change in bowel habits such as diarrhea or constipation and alternation of both or narrower stools, uh, general uh, stomach discomfort, which can include bloating, fullness, cramps, nausea or indigestion, strong need to always have to empty your bowels with very little stool coming out, a feeling that the bowel does not want to empty completely, anemia, chronic fatigue, and weight loss. So these are all symptoms that may signal that you have a colorectal cancer, but they're also symptoms that may signal you just have something else going on, especially rectal bleeding. It's not just because you have rectal bleeding that it means you have a colorectal cancer. It could be a number of other benign pathologies that need to be diagnosed. So at this point, you're going to be undergoing diagnostic tests, not screening tests. So what are the symptoms of early colorectal cancer? As you can see from this board, there are none. And that's the stage at which we want to catch these colorectal cancers at an early stage when you can still treat them and cure them. Another survey that was done by the Colon Cancer Alliance uh, looked at about 5,400 individuals. And when these patients were surveyed, 64% of them um, said they had been diagnosed with colorectal cancer because of symptoms. And most of these cancers could have been prevented had they been screened or surveyed in time. So before we go ahead and talk about prevention, let's talk a bit about the risk factors. So we already mentioned that after the age of 50, you're more likely to develop polyps. There's a 25 to 30% chance that you'll have some polyps. And that's equally true both in male and in female. And we see a bit of a higher risk in African Americans. There, if you have a personal history of polyps or colorectal cancer, or personal history of other cancers such as ovarian, endometrial, or breast cancers, as well as a personal history of inflammatory bowel disease, or other hereditary conditions such as HNPC, CRFAP, you are at higher risk. If you have a family history of polyps or colorectal cancer, especially if that relative had the cancer or the polyp before the age of 40, you're at much significantly higher risk. Dietary and social habits also can affect your risk. If you have a diet that's very poor in fruits and vegetables and high in fats and animal proteins, if you consume a lot of meats that are fried, broiled, or barbecued, if you're inactive or obese, and if you consume a lot of alcohol or smoke, these are all risk factors. So how do we prevent colorectal cancer? There are two types of strategies, and when we talk about screening and surveillance, we're really talking about secondary prevention to treat a problem that's there. But what about preventing the problem before it's created? What about preventing the formation of the polyps or the cancers altogether? Well, then we could look at modifications in diet and lifestyle or chemo prevention, and we'll talk about all these components. In terms of dietary modifications, you want to have a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables. We talk about at least five to ten servings a day. A diet that's low in fat, especially animal fats. You want to eat fewer fried, broiled, and barbecued meats because by frying them or barbecuing them or grilling them, you tend to uh, release carcinogens, heterocyclic uh, amines that are bad for, for you and can cause cancer. And you want a diet that's rich in vitamins and minerals, things like folate, selenium, 
vitamin A, C, E, uh, calcium, vitamin D. These are all very important components of your diet. Lifestyle changes are very important too. You want to make sure to maintain a healthy body weight with a body mass index of 20 to 25. You want to be physically active, do at least 30 minutes of exercise every day. And when I say 30 minutes, minutes of exercise, that's at least very brisk walking or running. Uh, you want to limit your alcohol consumption. And if you're a smoker, quit smoking. If you're not a smoker, avoid smoking and avoid secondhand smoke. <coughs> then a lot of people will ask, well, what else can I take that will help me prevent colon cancer? Well, that's what we talk about when we talk about chemo prevention, the administration of certain food products or components of food products or synthetic chemicals that can partially or totally prevent the development of neoplasms. And research has shown that aspirin can prevent the formation of polyps and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, can diminish the number of polyps you develop. Uh, but again, there are consequences to using these medications, things like bleeding, especially from peptic ulcer disease, if you have ulcers, or um, with Celebrex, for example, the new problems with uh, heart disease and palpitations and strokes. Uh, so you have to talk about your physician if you want to start taking these medications for, pre for prevention. Same thing with hormone replacement therapy in females. There have been a couple of studies that have shown that hormone replacement will help prevent colon cancer because the hormones will help uh, counteract some of the uh, chemicals that can cause carcinogenesis. However, some studies have shown that they don't. And furthermore, we know that hormone replacement therapy can increase your risk of breast cancer, endometrial cancer, risk of uh, clots and uh, strokes. So you, again, want to talk to your family doctor about using these if you are postmenopausal. Calcium and vitamin D, we already said, uh, folate and selenium. These are all vitamins and minerals that are important antioxidants that fight cancer. So all these taken in, um, in your foods, things like milk products, uh, folate you can find in green vegetables, and in uh, meats and grains, in wheats, um, in beans and legumes, and selenium, which you can find in high quantities in Brazilian nuts and other fruits and vegetables and grains. Or you can actually just take a multivitamin a day, and that will give you all that is necessary in terms of these components. <coughs> so despite all of this primary prevention, you still need to be screened. So that means you need to be examined. What do we mean by examinations and screening tests? Well, digital rectal exam is a first step. We also talk about looking for a cold blood in the stool, um, examination with a proctoscope or a sigmoidoscope, as well as barium enema, colonoscopy, virtual colonoscopy, and stool DNA testing, and we'll go through each one of these. Before the 1970s, all we had to rely on for screening were the finger and a rigid sigmoidoscope. And as you can see, a finger may be, may be 10 centimeters long and a tall man. <laughs> Um, the rigid sigmoidoscope will be about 25 centimeters long, so all you're really able to examine is the rectum at this point, so you'll miss a lot of cancers. And that was okay back then, because back then we knew that most of the cancers were located in the rectum and the sigmoid, and very few on the right side of the colon, so you might have actually found about 60% of the cancers just by doing those two tests. But nowadays we know that we're finding a lot more cancers on the right side of the colon, so you're going to miss more than 60% of the cancers if all you're going to do is a rectal exam. Nonetheless, a rectal exam is still a vital part of any examination for screening. <laughs> <laughs> and there are only two contraindications for not performing one. If you have no anus or no fingers, and that's very <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> The next step to the examination is a proctoscopic exam, which we perform routinely in the office when we see every patient prior to um, advising them for one of the screening tests. So this is performed in the office. This is the rigid scope that's inserted in the rectum. Uh, the patient has to have taken uh, two fleet enemas prior to this examination to empty out the rectum, otherwise we won't be able to visualize the inner lining of the rectum. And this will allow us to find polyps or tumors in this area of the bowel but it has to be performed by someone who's qualified, who knows how to, how to perform this properly, otherwise the patient will hurt. 
Since 1976, the flexible version of the, uh, sigmoid, the rigid uh, sigmoidoscope uh, has been created and is now available to all of us. This reaches up to about 65 uh, centimeters in the colon, so up to about your spine flexure um, up the left side of your colon. It's essentially a flexible tube uh, that contains a fiber optic with a light source, so it really allows you to properly examine the inner lining of the colon, but only on the left side. And this will help you detect up to 65% of polyps and cancers versus 25% with just that short, little, rigid sigmoidoscope that I showed you, this one here. A number of uh, case studies have shown us that uh, uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy will help reduce mortality from colorectal cancer by about 60 to 80%. Um, however, that's only for cancers on the left side of the colon and will not reduce the risk of cancers on the right side of the colon. If a polyp is found, you need, still need to undergo colonoscopy to survey the rest and to remove uh, the problem at hand or biopsy it. Uh, and again, since the tube is only about 60 centimeters long, you won't be able to, to inspect the right side, so you do need that colonoscopy. The next test we talked about was uh, fecal blood testing. So that's essentially a test that will allow us to see if there's any um, blood in the stool that's not visible to the naked eye. Um, essentially, when stool passes over polyps or tumors in the colon, those polyps or tumors are very vascular, and by scraping the surface of that, you're a, um, the polyp or the tumor will liberate a bit of minute blood into the stool, and that will be picked up by this test. Um, essentially, the test is performed by the patient at home. The patient takes three separate uh, samples of uh, stool that they smear on these cards, and the samples are then brought to the laboratory where a chemical reaction is performed on them. There have been a number of controlled trials that showed uh, the benefit of fecal occult blood testing and screening. Um, one of the American studies in Minnesota showed that by performing it annually, um, the mortality rate decreases by, by 33%. If it's performed every second year, the mortality rate decreases by 21%. And the other studies have confirmed that. So, I mean, it does decrease the mortality rate, and it does decrease the incidence of colorectal cancer, but not by much, and you're still missing a lot of cancers. And furthermore, you'll still need another test to prove or, or see if there is a polyp or a cancer causing the blood loss in the stool. Um, the other thing you have to remember, that blood in the stool, again, does not necessarily mean you have a colorectal cancer or a polyp. It could be due to hemorrhoids or a fissure or other benign pathology in the colon. There are also certain foods or drugs that can... Uh, present as blood in the stool or cause the test to be positive when in fact it's negative. Things like red meat or certain raw vegetables and fruits like cauliflower or broccoli, um, vitamin C supplements or anything that contains vitamin C, iron supplements, aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs and blood thinners can cause bleeding as well. Um, and again, they won't detect most of the cancers. You're going to miss over 60-70% of cancers and polyps. So what about combining the fecal occult blood test and the sigmoidoscopy? Well, one large study has done that. Uh, they looked at over 21,000 individuals, and those patients uh, that were found to, be, to have a polyp or a tumor uh, by flexible sigmoidoscopy and fecal occult blood test then had a barium enema and a colonoscopy. And essentially, the study showed after a 5- to 10-year follow-up that the survival rate was about 70% when you combine the two tests compared to 48% with sigmoidoscopy alone and the mortality rate significantly dropped as well. So the combination of these two tests will increase, increase the likelihood of early detection of colorectal cancer and also increase survival from it. But again, you're missing, you're not really screening properly the right side of the colon. It's assumed by combining the two, the fecal occult blood test may pick up some of the right side of pathology, but you'll still miss a lot of it. So what about barium enema? Uh, some of you may have had this examination. It's not a very comfortable examination. A rectal tube is inserted into the rectum, and then contrast fills the colon. And then x-rays are taken. They may also inject some air, so you get a double contrast image. And that will help you see polyps or any pathology in the colon. Unfortunately, unless a polyp is more than a centimeter, it'll probably be missed. And if uh, something, an abnormality is found, then you need a colonoscopy anyways to go and either remove it or biopsy it. And the test itself is not very comfortable either. So finally, we come to colonoscopy, which is essentially the gold standard for screening. 
the, colonosc the colonoscope is essentially like, like the sigmoidoscope, the flexible one. It's a long flexible tube, but this one actually reaches the end of the colon. So some of them measure up to 120, 140, 160 centimeters. Um, again, it's a fiber optic scope with a light source, and you're able to see all of the inner lining of the colon all the way over to the cecum. This is what our setup looks like. Um, and again, this allows us to remove polyps when we see them or to biopsy a tumor if we see one. And this is what the procedure looks like. The patient is lying on their left side. The instrument is inserted through the anus and advanced along the colon. And I'll show you some images of some pathology and also some uh, short movies of colonoscopy. But essentially, to prove the benefit of polypectomy, I'm going to go back to the national polyp study that I mentioned earlier. And again, the study looked at 14, over 1,400 individuals that had colonoscopy and polypectomy. And after about six-year follow-up, 80% of them had a repeat colonoscopy. And only five cancers were found in total. <coughs> Essentially, when these individuals were compared to uh, individuals who did not have any polypectomy over the last six, six seven years that had polypectomy at follow-up, the incidence of colorectal cancer decreased by 90% at three years, 88% at six years, and 76% at seven years. So that's quite significant. And the other important factor is that no symptomatic carcinomas were found. So the only carcinomas that were found were essentially cancers within polyps themselves, which are very early cancers, essentially cured when you remove the polyp. <coughs> so essentially, colon colonoscopy is what we want to perform ideally on all our patients but patients are very weary about this examination. So frequently asked questions about colonoscopy include, will you perform the examination, and if not, who will? Well, essentially, if you see me in the office, I'll be the one performing the exam, uh, unless I won't be available to do it, and then I would refer you to one of my colleagues, another colorectal specialist to do it, or a gastroenterologist. Will I be awake or asleep during the exam? Well, we don't completely put you to sleep. This is not performed under general anesthesia. It's performed under sedation and analgesia. So we'll give you something like fentanyl and Valium, Demerol and Valium, something that will relax you for the procedure. Will the examination hurt? Now, everyone's worried about having a painful exam. Um, during the course of the exam, we uh, insert a lot of air in the colon in order to open it up so we could get around it. And when we go around the curves, there could be some cramps as well. Uh, some people will fall asleep during the entire procedure, and others will have more cramping pain. So it really varies on the individual. If the colon has more bends and is more tortuous, then it will be more uncomfortable. How will I learn about the results of the examination? Well, right after the examination, we let you know what we found. We give you some time to recover from the sedation, and before you leave, we discuss the procedure with you. What kind of follow-up care will I need if the examination shows a problem? Well, we let you know that at the end of the procedure. If we found a polyp, we'll let you know whether or not you need to come back in a year or three or five. Um, if we found a tumor that we biopsied, we'll let you know that we will call you back with the results of the pathology. If the examination shows nothing wrong, when should I be examined again? Um, well, as you're, you'll see further on in the talk, um, some recommendations are every 10 years, but we actually recommend every five-year follow-up. Now, the other thing with colonoscopy, Unlike the flexible sigmoidoscopy or the proctoscopic exam, which only needs a couple of enemas, for colonoscopy, you need to completely purge your bowels. And this has been a nightmare for a lot of people who have undergone the old uh, preparations. But nowadays, we give patients what we call picosalax, which has been a blessing in the skies. And uh, patients do much better with this preparation and don't complain about it at all. So that should no longer be a fear for patients. So these are what we call polyps. These are on a stalk, this one has a flat base, and this is a snare that we use to remove the polyp when we find it. These are cancers. We want to avoid these. When we find them, we biopsy them um, to get a, a result, a diagnosis of cancer, and this definitely needs surgery. So I'm just going to show you a couple of clips of what colonoscopies look like when we perform polypectomies or when we find cancers and perform biopsies. So this is a polyp all the way in the cecum. You could tell that because the appendix is right at the base here. So we're using this lasso, what we call a snare, to go and wrap around this polyp and essentially strangulate it. And then cautery is applied. Essentially, a hot knife is applied to cut the polyp off. And once that's achieved, we're able to suck up the polyp through the scope. 
This is another polyp that's being retrieved at uh, the hepatic flexure. It's a significantly larger polyp, probably about 1.5 centimeters. This one will need to be grabbed with a snare to be brought out, or a basket will have to be put around it to bring it back out to retrieve it. This is a second uh, little clip. Essentially, here we're advancing through the sigmoid colon. This is in a patient uh, who had symptoms of rectal bleeding and weight loss and abdominal pain and cramps. Essentially, you see this big, large necrotic lesion. This is a cancer, a very advanced one. It's nearly obstructing the lumen of the bowel. It's a very friable tumor. You'll see with the, when the biopsy forehead goes to touch it. It's a very hard tumor, and it bleeds very easily. And essentially, that's the biopsy forceps that we're going to use to biopsy this tumor to get a pathologic reading on the specimen. So then we talk about newer techniques for screening, and that includes virtual colonoscopy, which is a, actually a very nice test. And um, although it's becoming very popular, it still doesn't compare to colonoscopy. Um, essentially, the way this is done, this is essentially a CT scan of the ab abdomen that's then reconstructed into a 3D image to visualize the inner lining of the colon, very similarly to a colonoscopy. Unfortunately, it's not as sensitive as colonoscopy, so it'll miss a lot of polyps that are less than half a centimeter or even less than, than a centimeter. And occasionally, if there's stool that's still stuck onto the, on the bowel wall, it'll uh, think that it's uh, either a cancer or a polyp. So uh, next step would be a colonoscopy for these people, because you cannot retrieve polyps or take biopsies using a virtual colon colonoscopy. Um, it is, however, much more sensitive than barium enema, and it's very useful in patients who have difficult colonoscopies, very long, torturous colons are def very difficult to get through, that we have gone through in the past and have not seen any polyps, so it's a great test to follow up for screening in the next five to 10 years. Um, and the other uh, ideal uh, purpose for it is in patients who have nearly obstructing lesions where we cannot go and screen the rest of the colon because we cannot got, not get through that uh, tumor that's nearly obstructing. Then we have this tool-based DNA screening, which is very similar um, a procedure to the fecal called blood testing. Um, essentially, it allows you to screen the entire colon. It's not invasive. It's a test that's performed at home. So it's very convenient. It will pick up more polyps and more cancers than the fecal called blood test. But again, it'll miss a lot of cancers, or you'll only detect about 40% of the cancers. So you do need a colonoscopy when this test is positive um, as well. So we're just going to review some of the lifestyle changes that we need to do or make in order to lower our risk of colorectal cancer. We talked about getting screened regularly being physically active, maintaining a healthy weight, eating less red meat, taking a multivitamin a day that contains folate and selenium, limit the amount of alcohol that we drink, eat lots of fruits and vegetables, avoid smoking, and get screened, get screened, get screened regularly. I think you're getting the point. <laughs> so not screening is no longer an option. So how do we go about screening a huge population? We're talking about women, men, people of all uh, races. Well, first we have to find out who's at risk. And this uh, graph lets, uh, shows us exactly who's at risk. And like we've mentioned before, we see that male and females are both at risk. The incidence of polyps and cancers increase after the age of 40 and significantly more after the age of 50. Um, and the mortality rates follow that trend as well. And again, the risk in the general population over 50 is five to six times over a lifetime. If you have one, one first-degree relative that has a colon cancer, your risk is two to three times as high. If you have two relatives uh, that are first-degree with colorectal cancer, the risk is three to six times as high. If the family uh, relative with the colorectal cancer was 50 years old when he had the cancer or she had the cancer, the risk is also significantly higher. Um, the risk is less with second and third degree relatives, but again, when two or three of them have colorectal cancer, the risk is about equal to that of one single uh, first degree relative. And finally, patients who have hereditary conditions like HNPCC and FAP, the risk is much higher and is 100% in cases of FAP. 
And patients with inflammatory bowel disease, like in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, those patients have to a 30% lifetime risk of developing cancer. So those are all the patients that need to be screened. And we have guidelines from, from a number of American gastroenterological and colorectal associations that have put these guidelines together. And although the American uh, um, uh, College of Surgeons did not participate in forming these guidelines, they strongly endorse it. So what are the screening strategies for the average risk patient? We say average risk, that these are patients over 50 that have no other risk factors. So for these patients, we described all the tests that are possible. You have the hemocult, which is testing for blood in the stool, or the flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years, or a combination of the two, or a barium enema and flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years, or a colonoscopy every 10 years. Now, most of the associations prefer to perform one of these two, either the barium enema and flexible sigmoidoscopy, or the gold standard nowadays is the colonoscopy. If you have a family history, you start screening after the age of 40, not 50, so you start much earlier. Um, or you start 10 to 15 years earlier than the family relative that's affected. And this goes for patients whose relatives had the, the polyp after the age of 55, or a cancer after the age of 60. So again, for these patients, the screening options are the same. You just start at the age of 40 instead of 50. So what if you have a family history, but the f relative had the colon cancer at a younger age, under the age of 55? Well, then again, you start screening at 40 or 10 to 15 years earlier than the relative with the cancer, but what is recommended is really a colonoscopy every 10 years, or if you cannot have the colonoscopy, a barium enema and flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years. For the heredit hereditary, sorry, hereditary conditions, and we talk about genetic counseling and testing for these individuals. For FAP, we talk about starting with a flexible sigmoidoscopy at the age of 12, and uh, once polyps are found, then surgery is recommended. And for HNPCC, we start with either colonoscopy or barium enema every one to two years. It's important to mention that this has to be a full scope and a full exam because with HNPCC, they're more uh, susceptible to having colon cancers on the right side of the colon. And that examination starts around the age of 20 to 30 and uh, is performed every one to two years and then subsequently every year after the age of 40. So once uh, you've had polyps removed, or you've had a cancer diagnosed and removed, or if you have inflammatory bowel disease, we talk now not about screening, but about surveillance of the colon, because you're more predisposed to developing another polyp or another cancer. So if you've had a polyp removed, and uh, you've had either a large polyp or multiple polyps removed, then the next exam sh should be a colonoscopy that's performed three years later. And if that's normal, then it should be performed five years after that. If you have a very large, uh, very flat lesion that was removed in pieces and not completely removed, then the exam should be performed every three to six months or sometimes every 12 months until the lesion compl completely disappears. If you've had a curative resection for colorectal cancer and you never had a colonoscopy prior to the, uh, to the surgery, then you should definitely have one within a year after surgery. Um, otherwise, the, uh, screen, the surveillance is at one year, at three years, and then at five years after surgery. <laughs> For patients with inflammatory bowel disease, a colonoscopy should be performed every one to two years. If the patient has limited disease to the left side, to the, um, left side of the colon, we start the screening or the surveillance at 15 years. If the patient has uh, disease throughout the colon, we start the surveillance at eight years. So essentially, it doesn't matter which test you get. The best test is the test that gets done. So it's important to get screened no matter what you use to get screened. So get the test, find the polyp, stop the cancer. That's the message for the day before it's too late. That's the end of the talk. For those of you who haven't heard the colorectal song, yeah. well, by Bowser and Blue, we'll just play it for you. We praise the colorectal surgeon, misunderstood and much maligned, slaving away in the heart of darkness, working where the sun don't shine. <laughs> Respect the colorectal surgeon, it's a calling few would crave. Lift up your hands and join us, let's all do the finger wave. <laughs> When it comes to spreading joy, there are many techniques. 
Some spread joy to the world and others just spread cheeks. Some may think the cardiologist is their best friend. But the colorectal surgeon knows he'll get you in the end. Why the colorectal surgeon? It's one of those mysterious things. Is it because in that profession there are always openings? <laughs> When I first met a colorectal surgeon, he did not quite understand. I said, "Hey, it's nice to meet you, but do you mind if we don't shake hands?" <laughs> He sailed right through medical school because he was a whiz. Oh, but he never thought of psychology, though he read passages. A doctor he wanted to be for golf. He loved to play, but this is not quite what he meant by 18 holes a day. <laughs> Surgeon misunderstood and much maligned, slaving away in the heart of darkness, working where the sun don't shine. Thank you.